All right, everyone, thank you for coming to Waka, Some of Art of Japanese Poetry. Uh, we're going to go over various things, haiku, tanka, rango, where they come from, where they are. So first, let's get it on. We're going to use the term syllable in this a lot, but uh, in uh, traditional Japanese, they would use on. Now, on and syllable are often transliterated to that, or translated to that. However, they don't necessarily equate. Uh, we say syllable because we speak English and that's how our language works. But in Japanese, they would use on. Uh, on sometimes equate out to a syllable, but often they don't. For instance, a few common words that you might see. Uh, do you know Japanese stuff? Uh, first, Nippon, which is just Japanese for Japanese. Uh, it's two syllables, Nippon. But with on, it's four syllables. Ni, pu, po, n. The n uh, is its own on. As a matter of fact, on is a single syllable word. On. But it's two on. Po and n. Uh, Tokyo is a two syllable word. To, kyo. Uh, however, in on, it is four. To, yu, kyo, yu. Osaka is a three syllable word. O, sa, ka. In on, it is four. O, o, sa, ka. Samurai is one that actually matches up correctly. Four and four. Sa, mu, rai. Sa, mu, rai. So, what is waka? Waka literally means Japanese poetry. Wa <laughs> was what the Chinese people called the Japanese, and ka is simply means poems or poetry. Uh, when language first really started to come to a head in Japanese, they basically took Chinese and decided, we're going to take this and we're going to pronounce it differently. And that's basically what Japanese is. Uh, at least as far as kanji goes. <clears throat> uh, Japanese writing uh, is, uh, they have several different forms, but the main form is kanji, and that is just Chinese letters uh, that they pronounce differently. Uh, in Chinese, those same letters would be called Hanzi, the writing of the Han people, or the Chinese people. So waka is Chinese for Japanese poetry. Also known as Yamato Uta. There are several other terms for it, but Yamato Uta is probably the most intrinsic besides waka. Yamato Uta is Japanese for waka. Uh, when waka really first started coming about, often it was written Chinese, and then waka started to come about, which was pretty much the same poems, but written in Japanese instead of Chinese. Originally had five different forms. We'll get to those on the next one. I just like this comment. Hey, Papyrus! The ladies down the library asked me to design a summit, design a sign for a summit they're hosting on Japanese syllabic poetry. I need a second opinion. Hmm. International Haiku Appreciation Conference inside. Hmm. It's a haiku. <clears throat> so the five forms of waka poetry. We have the choka, the long poem. It is comprised of a, se uh, a series of interchanging syllabic meters of five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables, and then it repeats five, seven, five, five, seven, five, five, seven, five, until it ends with a two line uh, meter of seven syllables each. So the shortest choka you could have would be five, seven, five, uh, I'm losing myself. Five seven five seven five seven seven. Uh, second form is the tonga. That is the short poem. It is just five seven five seven seven. Uh, if you were with us in the Renga workshop earlier today, uh, that's what a Renga is. We'll touch on this later too. Uh, it's a tonga written between two people. We have the kata uta. The Really short poem. It is just five seven ten. You 
have the Sadoka, the repeating poem, it's just two kata uta together. Five, seven, seven, five, seven, seven. And you have the, I always mispronounce this one too, uh, Usoke Sekika, the Buddhist footprint poem. It is five, seven, five, seven, seven, seven. Four of these forms went out of style uh, in the early Heian period, or even before that. By the time of the end of the Heian period, uh, Tonka was the dominant form. To the point that if you were to try to research Waka, often you will just wind up in the modern day with a bunch of Tonka. Because all of the other forms of poetry are basically dead at this point. And Tonka is really the only thing that kind of held out to the end. Uh, even into, I mean, by the 13th century, very rarely did you see any of the other ones. Uh, Choka, Kata Uta, or Sadoka. Choka, I barely know her. <laughs> she has to put up with this every day. <laughs> one of the short, shortest, one of the shortest Choka known is by Yamano. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> is uh, by Yamanoi no Ukura. <clears throat> uh, it is, uh, follows along, as I said, the shortest possible form of choka. Uri hameba, kodomo omohoyu, kuri hameba, mashite, shirowayu, isuku, yori, kitamishi monoso, manakai ni moto no kakarite yasumishi masumu. Which in English, when I eat melons, my children come to mind. When I eat chestnuts, the longing is even worse. Where do they come from? Flickering before my eyes, making me helpless, endlessly, night after night, not letting me sleep in peace. He wrote it while he was traveling. He missed his children. Uh, <clears throat> but that is a choka. Uh, nine different lines. It's about the shortest choka you can have. And it's the shortest one recorded in any of the uh, anthologies of poetry, which were very popular in Japan. <clears throat> we then have the honka. Uh, comes at the end of a choka. Uh, in the West, we would refer to this as an envoy. Uh, in a lot of poetry, uh, particular, uh, particularly French poetry, so that's where envoy comes from. But a lot of European poetry, they often had kind of a, a Postscript. You know, here's my poem. P.S. This is a much shorter poem to comment on it. Uh, the Japanese had that too. Uh, at the end of a choka, they would have their envoy, which they referred to as a honka. The honka was always read in tonka form. Uh, that particular poem I just read to you had a honka. <coughs> uh, and it was Shirokane mo Kogane mo Tamomo Nani se muni Masareru Takara. Only she coming on. Which in English is. That would make you come better. Yeah, that would. <clears throat> so in English is, what are they to me? Silver or gold or jewels? How could they ever be equal to the greater treasure that is a child that they cannot? He still misses kids. As I said, the honka, the honka is written in tonka form. Uh, five seven five seven seven. As I said, with the honka, they really only followed a choka. You certainly wouldn't follow it with, uh, you wouldn't follow a tonka with a honka because then you've just written two tonka. Uh, the choka were popular in the uh, pre Heian period and in the early Heian period. However, as the Heian period progressed, it became less and less popular. Uh, I believe when the first poetry anthology starts, a lot of them are choka. Uh, there's a few sadoka and kata and tonka. And by the time the third or fourth one is out, most of them are now tonka. <coughs> so I mentioned the kata uta and the sadoka. Kata uta is a short poem of a 577 syllabic meaning. Uh, it literally means poem fragment. Kata is the fragment Uta is poem. So Kata Uta poem fragment. Uh, these were popular for just kind of like throw it out there. You see something, 
beautiful, you want to impress someone, so you would, uh, five, seven, six, five, this, that, and the other thing. <clears throat> the Sudoka, however, is comprised of two kata uta combined, often in the form of a dialogue. These were popular at one point, like I said, in the early Heian period. The first kata uta speaks, and the second responds. <clears throat> uh, the second one may contradict or even argue against the first. Uh, sometimes, uh, a Sudoku would be written between two people. Often it was written by the same person, but taking essentially two different sides of an argument. So essentially playing devil's advocate with themselves. Uh, sometimes the second kata uta worked along with the first one, but often it was, like I said, an argument against it. I grip my longsword and speak not of the dead as I cut the chaff from the grain. That is a kata uta. You throw a second one on there and you create a uh, sudoka. Why bother with swords when grass can be so easy to cut with a sharp sickle? See, it contradicts the first one and argues against it. In some of these poetry anthologies, uh, they would have, you know, almost making a choka if it had followed the same pattern. Almost making, you know, a choka sized poem out of multiple sudoka, essentially arguing back and forth like two people having a dialogue. Another example of a Sudoka for our more modern era. Rihanna is a wonderful orator of sublime musical delight. She was in a film. His title was Battleship. Neither she nor ever very good. <laughs> Pose that one to several people and nobody has yet to argue with me. Strange. <laughs> So here we get into the real meat of it, the Tonka. As I said, the Tonka eventually usurped the throne of all of these. Originally, you were regarded by your poetry skill on how well you could write a choka, and then eventually became on how well you can do a Tonka. As I said, the Tonka consists of uh, five lines, five and seven syllables. Sometimes it is also called a Misto Hitomoji, meaning 31 syllables, because five, seven, five, seven, five, seven, 31. Uh, this is where we get the haiku from, but the haiku comes centuries after the Tonka is formed. Uh, as I said, the Tonka is essentially a very short choka. Uh, so, the haiku. As I said, it comes from this. So, haiku is a mistranslation of hoku. In the mid and into the later Edo period, uh, I guess I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Uh, in the Heian period, uh, it was very important for poetry to be written in a specific way. And that's part of why the Tonka became popular, I feel at least. Uh, there was essentially a list of words, and these were poetic words. And these were the words you could make a poem out of. I mean, there's thousands of words out there. But these, mm, say 300 words, those are the ones you can use. Well, that kind of limits what you can do with a poem. And so, uh, it was considered if you used anything outside of those 300 words, uh, you were scum. You, you weren't really respected. You, you wrote commoner poetry. <clears throat> and poetry was, you know, the writing of the, arist uh, the, arist the aristocracy. <clears throat> Into the, uh, well, post and, you know, post Heian period, you get to the Moromachi and the Sengoku period, you know, the era of the warring states, is oddly enough where poetry really starts to flourish again. Because by the end of the Heian period, there's only so much you can do with a very specific syllabic meter and a few hundred odd words. So by that point, everybody kind of felt that every poem we could write has been written, and we're basically recycling each other's lines and just putting them in different orders. Sengoku period, stuff started to relax again, and it was, well, we can add these words to it, they sound pretty poetic too, and, and we can add these words to it. Some poets even believe no words are off limits. <clears throat> we get into the Edo period, however. Uh, by this point in time, the Tonka is the way to go. This is the main form of poetry. And once again, we're starting to, well, 
This word's not really poetic, so we'll put it on the blacklist. You shouldn't use that one. Neither should you use this one. Until you get, once again, eventually a list of words that these are the poetic words, these are the ones that you should use. Uh, the Edo period was also a far stricter political climate than the Heian period was, so there were also a few words that, we don't like these ones, and if you use these ones, we're gonna probably beat the crap out of you and possibly execute you because uh, these ones are kind of anti togo <clears throat> But when you get to uh, Masuo Kashiki and Matsuo Basho, a lot of these guys thought poetry should be more free. Uh, Shiki particularly helped to coin the term hoku, and Matsuo ba uh, Basho really liked uh, haikus as well. So, the hoku was the first three lines of a tonga. That is the 575, and that's where we, like I said, that's where we get a haiku from. Uh, Originally it was called the Kaminogu, that is the top part of the Tonka. The Shimonogu is the bottom part, the two lines of seven uh, several meters. <clears throat> I have a lot of fun with my. <laughs> I have a lot of fun with my slide. Yeah. That is it. Tonka is the most numerous of various styles of Waka. <clears throat> And even it's broken into two types. There is the traditional tonka, as I said, five seven five seven seven, and then there is renga, the linked verse. <clears throat> Rengo was very popular with the kuge on the samurai during the Sengoku period. That's where it really started to develop. Because in an era known as the Warring States, the most important thing to samurai was, is my poetry good? <clears throat> a story I love. Uh, during the Genpei War, and this is still during the Heian times, uh, the Minamoto are starting to win the war. They're beating back the tyrant. They've captured the capital, and the tyrant army is fleeing back west, burning everything in their path, so that the Minamoto have nothing to continue the war with. And there's a particular tyrant samurai. Like I said, he's on the run, and he knows that his poetry teacher in the capital has been ordered by the emperor to assemble an anthology of poetry. As I said, that was popular back in the day. He didn't have time to see him before he left. So, several days out, he turns around and rides back to the capital, which is in enemy hands, and goes to see his poetry teacher. And he says, hey, my family is losing. We're probably all about to be, you know, eliminated. From his armor, he pulls out a sheet of paper. He says, here are a few poems that I've written. I hope that maybe at least one of them is good enough to include in the anthology. So he's deep behind enemy territory. And it's like, whew, I gotta get these poems to you, because I hope you'll include them in your book. Now, the great news for him is one of them was chosen. The bad news is it was after the war was over, the Tyra were no longer really liked, so it is, in the book, attributed as anonymous. So he didn't get the recognition that he wanted from it. <clears throat> uh, but when we get into, as I said, the Sengoku period, that's where, you know, the Japanese start to develop, you know, the samurai start to develop. Well, you know what else I like? I like tea. Let's have tea parties. <laughs> and during these tea parties, you need something to do. Uh, one of the popular things was flower arrangement. Give you a bunch of flowers, a little pot, and arrange them how you think they would look. Because these were die-hard walkers. Uh, another one that I liked was looking at paintings and commenting on them. What do you think the artist was thinking when he painted this? Probably thinking about a crane, since that's what's on the picture. But hey, whatever. <laughs> and it developed, well, let's recite poetry. So they would talk about poetry from days on end, you know, things written in the Heian period. And then it became, well, let's talk about our own poetry. And that is where Renga really started to develop. Renga was joint cooperative poetry. It may be in the form of the host comes and you know, once you're making tea and all, he would comment on something. Often, either the painting or the flower arrangement, something in there or something nearby the window and they could see out. And he would give the Kaminoku 575 poem. And then all of his guests would respond with Shimonoku, the two uh, seven syllable lines. 
And then they would kind of decide, well, who had the best one? Well, you get the most priority points today. Sometimes they would actually pair up and make a game out of it. So if there's, you know, four people in the or, or four people in the tea ceremony, well, you and you know, me and you are partners, and you two are partners. And you know, I'll write a kaminoku, you write the shimonoku, and you know, we'll decide which group has the better poem. <clears throat> And sometimes it would honestly come to blows. Uh, Kechi Mitsuhide, for anybody who doesn't know anything about the Sengoku period, Oda Nobunaga was kind of de facto ruler. Uh, he had conquered almost all of the central plains, and at this particular time, in 1582, he currently has an army marching west, conquering pretty much everything in his path. He has a close ally taking the southeast, conquering everything there, taking out the clan. He has an army going through the northeast, taking out the venerable Uwasugi clan, and he has an army preparing to sail across the small channel in, uh, of Awaji and invade Shikoku and start taking that over. And he's about to send a second army to go through the northern half of the west. And it was at this time the commander of that second army decides, mm, I'm going to turn around and take these troops and just kill you while your guard is down and you're uh, praying at a Buddhist temple, and that is the incident at Hanoji. That general who betrayed him was Akechi Mitsuhide. Uh, there are various theories for why Akechi just suddenly out of the blue attacked Nobunaga and, you know, killed him. One of them is that Nobunaga constantly criticized his poetry. <clears throat> they would do things in public, and, you know, these renga parties. You know, Oda would come up with a kaminoku, and Mitsuhide would come up with a shimonoku, and Oda would say, oh, it's terrible, why don't I even invite you to these things? Oh, you're, you're the worst. Mitsuhide would write his poetry and you know, publish it as I like to do, and Nobunaga would criticize him, but like, oh, he's got poor form, he's not using the right words, he doesn't know what he's doing. And that's often one of the things that they cite for why Mitsuhide just suddenly turned around and was like, I'm going to kill you and burn this temple down. Because <clears throat> with all poetry, it started out with the Kuge, the court nobles, and then a samurai took it over, similar to how the government worked. Originally, the emperor ruled everything, and then the court nobles kind of usurped power from him, not necessarily violently. Uh, when you are a dynastic, divine ruler, eventually you decide, this day-to-day -day stuff is boring, why don't you do it for me? And so the Kuge came to power. And then the Kuge were like, this day-to-day -day stuff is boring, Samurai, you are my servants. Why don't you start doing it? And eventually, we get you know the Sengoku period where the samurai rule all. Uh, Shogun. <clears throat> so at this point in time, like I said, the Renga has become popular with samurai. Uh, I guess I kind of already touched on all that. So uh, the two parts, the Kaminoku and the Shimonoku, would be combined to create a Tonga. Tonka is whenever it's done by a singular person. Renga is whenever it's done by two, or like I said, more people. Uh, one of the most infamous forms of poetry among the samurai is the jisei, the death poem. Whenever you look up samurai poetry, often that's what you find, a lot of jisei. Uh, <clears throat> they're usually written in Tonka form, but not always. One of the ones we're going to go over uh, later on is... It is particularly written in Tonka form, but that's because it's just the last part of it. Uh, Hojo Ujimasa wrote his death poem in Choka form, which by this point in time would have probably been a very rarity. Uh, the Jisei was written just prior to Samurai's death. And this could be death on the battlefield, he's wounded on the battlefield, he knows he won't make it home, so he writes a poem. Uh, it could be something uh, sometimes Jisei are attributed to, they wrote a poem before they went off to battle, and they didn't come back, so that last poem they wrote is their jisei. Sometimes, particularly in the Edo period, where it became very, seppuku became very ritualized, part of the ritual became writing your final poem. <clears throat> As I said, Hojo Ujimasa, this is just the last part of his choka, this is his envoy, his hanka. Wagami ima, shou ya ika, omofubeki. Sore yori ki tari, sore e ka arena. Or English. Now we disappear, 
Well, what must we think of it? From the sky we came. Now we may go back again. That's at least one point of view. Show me, total one. <clears throat> like I said, that is just a honk. That's just the last point. Uh, his death poem was an Achoka. This was before he committed seppuku after being defeated by Toyotomi Hideyoshi. Uh, another example. Minamoto no Yorimasa. This is the guy that really started the fan of the Jisei. <clears throat> uh, in the start of the Genpei War in the Heian period, where the Minamoto and Taira are really facing off, <clears throat> Taira have won the, well, the Minamoto and Taira combined won in the Hogan disturbance, but the Taira gained more esteem. And then the Minamoto rebelled against them and were put down. Yorimasa was part of the Minamoto clan, but he was personal friends with the leader of the Taira clan, so generally he remained neutral and sometimes actually sided against his own clan. At this point in time, he has decided, all right, I've got to be loyal to my clan, and I've got to stop this before the Minamoto is totally wiped out. So he starts his own rebellion, and as has been the case so far, he loses. <clears throat> in the process of the final battle, Battle of Uji Bridge, he's old, he's now into his 60s, uh, actually he's into his 70s, and he gets wounded in the arm. He recognizes the fact that I can't go on. So, he tells the troops to continue fighting. He tells the prince that he's protecting to run away. You know, we'll guard the van, or we'll guard the rear guard. He retires under a tree, pulls off his armor, takes his paper fan, pulls the paper off of it, and pulls out a calligraphy box. The enemy is breaking through his lines. He doesn't have time to mix up ink, as would traditionally be done. So he dips the calligraphy brush into the wound in his arm, and with his own blood on the paper of his fan writes this final poem. Umore yu no hanasaku kotomo nakarishi ni mi no naruhate zo kanushi karike Or in English Like a fossil tree from which we gather no flowers Sad has been my life Faded no fruit to produce Now of course I'm sure his two sons who were fighting to protect him long enough for him to write this poem really appreciated that last part. <laughs> they all three died in this battle, by the way. Uh, one of his sons was struck in the head with an arrow and just dropped right there. The other son was able to the other son was able to fight long enough to commit seppuku himself. So after writing this poem, he steps fan back together, picked up the uh, dagger you can see there, wrapped in another sheet of paper. Stabbed himself in the stomach, ran it across through, and one of his retainers cut off his head. That retainer then grabbed the head, tied a rock to it, ran to the river's edge, and threw it in the river. Because taking heads was very uh, important in Japanese warfare. So whoever took the head could claim, look, I killed him. Even if they didn't, you could just say, look, I got Minamoto no Yorimasa's head, and this would guarantee them land and privileges and good titles. So it was the final, you know, kick in the pants. Not only did you not get the opportunity to kill me, I killed myself before you could do it, but you also didn't get to steal my head. <clears throat> and that was his Jisei. And from that point, it became popular. If you were on the losing end of things, perhaps you were sitting in your castle and it was on fire and you're like, well, I'm not getting out of this. So before you would commit seppuku, you would write a poem, a death poem. And Yorimasa was really the first to kind of ritualize it and make it popular. He was the most important person up to that point, not to say that nobody had done it before, but he was the most important person at that point to, in the middle of the battlefield, decide, I'm going to die. I better write this down. <laughs> what, may I ask? Uh, what was done with the, all of these poems? Did like the I guess whoever won like collect them, like go to all the bodies and say, okay, well we got this, these poems and stuff like that, and then create an anthology? Or often it was a matter of I mean, in battle, very rarely is it a total annihilation. So a lot of times it would be you know here's in this particular case he wrote the poem, snapped it back together. His retainer that took his head, threw it in the river, ran off with his fan, uh, and a lot of times too. The records say this is what he did. We 
don't know for sure. It could have been a retainer afterwards going, you know what would make the guy that I served up until death sound really good? If he had written a poem that sounded like this. We don't know for sure in a lot of cases. Uh, yeah, well, one of my favorites is Shimano Katsuye is defeating a guy. The guy is beaten, he is about to be killed, and he writes a final poem stating the... I, I, I don't have it in my brain right now, word for word, but he states that... Because they're all Buddhists, remember, so they have some vague, you know, idea of reincarnation. So he believes that after going through the path of Asura, even if he has to become a demon himself, and he gets reincarnated, Kill Katsuye in his next life. So, more than likely, he would have been like, okay, give that to him. <laughs> and, you know, poetry was very important for samurai, so a lot of times they would be, he said, collected. Uh, we know most of the most noble people because uh, in some sentences you hear you have stories, you read the. Uh, uh, you know, the, the war, the Genpei War. And a lot of them talk about how, especially if things are getting dire, they would maintain morale by playing music and writing poetry all night. And these would be their final poems. So if somebody survived with this collection of poems, uh, I don't know if anybody's ever seen the movie Letters from Iwo Jima, uh, a major part of near the end whenever the Americans, spoiler alert, the Americans win the battle, uh, <laughs> when the Americans are pushing deeper into the island, one of the main characters has all these letters, all this correspondence of all, you know, his fellow soldiers who have written back home, but their supply lines have been cut off, so these letters weren't able to get home. And he has tasked himself with, I have to protect these. It's kind of that idea. A lot of times it was somebody's job to, okay, this is, you know, this is what I have to do. I have to keep these poems and protect them. Uh, sometimes it was, you know, they would write them and be like, okay, you know, I might die, so I'm going to write this poem, and I'm going to send it back home. And then they would die in a battle in three days or five days or a few weeks perhaps, and their family would be like, well, then this was his death poem, this was the last poem he wrote. And that's how some of them were published. Uh, some anthologies did include Jisei. Uh, most of the anthologies were ones written outside of battle, but some of them were included. Uh, in the modern era, we have a lot of these records that state, you know, this was, you know, this person died and this was their death poem. And it's kind of like a little tag in there in these, uh, uh, they're called key, which means chronicles. A lot of these chronicles have a little, it's kind of like a footnote, you know, yeah, you know, we defeated this guy and he died and this was his last poem. And then we went on and did this, and then we just have a fascination with Jisei, so we can lick them and publish them ourselves. <clears throat> so the next form of poem is uh, the, the, uh, Usokasekika. It's named after a series of poems written on the foot of a Buddha statue in Yakushiji, Nara. Uh, there are 17 poems praising Buddha's virtue, and there are four poems preaching a Buddhist path. Uh, basically, 17 things telling you this is what you should do, and four things telling you this is what you shouldn't do. Uh, <clears throat> in Buddhism, particularly in the very older aspects of it, uh, there was kind of an iconoclasm to it. They believe that you shouldn't depict the Buddha. Similar to what we have in uh, Islam today, you can't portray the poet Muhammad. Once upon a time in Christianity, you couldn't portray Christ or any of the apostles. A uh, long time ago in Russia, the Orthodox Church was really great with their iconoclasm. They tore down murals and destroyed stained glass windows and all this stuff of their own religion because they believed that it was sacrilegious to, you know, draw it or paint it. Uh, in Buddhism, it was also considered sacrilegious to quote the Buddha. The idea was, he said these things and you were supposed to ponder it and think it and understand it. So you could write, you know, what you thought of what he said, but you can't write what he said because what he said was divine. And to copy it down implies that you are trying to copy him. You're mocking his divinity. <clears throat> but, uh, go off a little tangent there, uh, as you couldn't portray him. So, I mean, we have these great big statues of Buddha now because things eventually changed in Buddhism. But originally, you couldn't make a statue of the Buddha because that was sacrilegious. But you could make a statue of the impact he had on an area. 
so you would do a footprint of him. The Buddha had been here, and these were his thoughts when he was here. And that's what a lot of these Buddha footprint poems are. They were something that uh, became popular in India, and as Buddhism spread into China, became somewhat popular in China. And so when Buddhism spread from China to Japan, <clears throat> they brought this idea. Uh, the particular statue in Yakushiji Nara is the most famous one. Uh, there is some scholarly debate over whether or not these are the only ones that count, the one on these particular, and that that is what Musekika is, uh, Buso Musekika, is these these 20 some odd poems on this particular statue, and nothing else counts as Buso Kusekika. Uh, and then there's also some that believe that, well, anything written in that 575-777 uh, meter should be considered a Buso Kusekika. <clears throat> a little bit of a schedule, but not too much. So, an example of Buso Kusekika. If you take it, like I said, in the vaguest of terms, this is one written uh, by myself that I use for our Rango panel uh, to start things off. The authority of several hundred men, all of advanced age, should not persuade us to find ugly what is beautiful, nor beautiful what is not. And that is how I opened our Rango workshop earlier today. Uh, that runs on the same meter of Busoke Sekika. Like I said, there's a scholarly debate. Would that count? because, one, it's not Buddhist, uh, two, it's not on a footprint statue, and three, it's not a thousand-year-old one on a Buddhist footprint statue in Yakushiji Nara. So, uh, these are a lot of examples I use in the Rango workshop to give you uh, the gist of, you know, how some of these poems worked. Uh, so, a hoku, as I said, is a haiku. It's an example of a haiku, I'm sure you all have these in high school. A wise man once asked, why every tail is the sand wet? Because the seaweed. <laughs> Twice you've had to put through that. Yep. Following along with the uh, water theme, refreshing and cool, love is a sweet summer rain that washes the world. Uh, don't listen to the slide, though. This is what I used in the uh, regular workshop. So, an example of Renga. As I said, it's a Tonga. Uh, a Tonga. The Kamidoku is, I peer into the valley before Mount Fuji, I see a river. <clears throat> now, uh, like I said, I mentioned this in the Renga workshop, but poetry was very important to samurai. <clears throat> uh, in the Heian period, your spouse would be chosen based on your poetic skill as a man. Uh, you would be introduced to a woman, either by her father or your father or an intermediary, and you would get to know her a little bit and spend some time with her, and you would, she would spend the night in your chambers. Anybody can take a guess what might have happened at that time. It was probably tea and poetry. <laughs> I'm sorry, you would spend the night in her chambers, not the other way around, I said that backwards. Uh, but you had to be gone by morning. If the sun rose and you were still there, then it was scandalous. So you had to leave before sunrise. You would go home and you would sit down and write her a poem. And you would send the poem to her and she would judge it based on your poetic capability and your penmanship, which means I would never get married because I can't write for him. <laughs> I look like a doctor but don't have the PhD to go with it. And based on your poetic skill and your handwriting, she would decide if you got a second date or not. If you did get that second date, you would go back over to her parents' house again, you would spend the night with her one more time, and you would go back home, write her another poem. She liked that second one, then you got a third date. You go there, you spend the night the third time, and this time you would stay until after sunrise. And her parents would walk in and <gasps> catch you, because they totally didn't know you were there. And then you would have breakfast with her parents, and then you were married. <laughs> You would have these rice cakes called, uh, I remember them, uh, mochi no naku or something like that, and it's the uh, third night rice cake is what they were called. And once you share these rice cakes with, you know, these third night rice cakes with her parents, you were now married to her. <clears throat> uh, so like I said, poetry was a big part of that. 
you may be a samurai walking through the halls and your boss is walking the other way and he kind of looks at you and he says, I peer into the valley before Mount Fuji. I see a river. You are supposed to instinctually be able to understand that's the kami no ku to a poem and he's expecting a shimo no ku. So perhaps you respond, the water looks clean and cool. I am thirsty for knowledge. And he'll look at you and go, it's pretty good one, and simply walk away. But now you've got brownie points. The next time promotions are coming through, he's going to remember, Rich had a pretty good poem. He must be a smart guy. I'm going to put him in charge of the fields. That's how important poetry was, was, was to the samurai. I mentioned a Kachi Mitsuhide. Nobody caught that sort. Another example that I used in the Rango workshop. Sorry, go ahead. I spit in the face of my dearest love, for they love only my wealth. Like stags who eat illness, while the wolves watch in delight. <clears throat> this one is kind of based on a, uh, kind of a, a thing that Japanese parents tell their children. Uh, the ideology being, you're trying to teach your kids against greed. So, there's of course the parable of deer who find some delicious leaves and they begin eating them and they just eat and eat and eat until they've made themselves sick. All the while a pack of wolves is patiently waiting, you know, they keep eating like this, we're going to have a bigger meal and they won't be able to run. So once they make themselves sick, the wolves attack and they can't even run away because they're too sick. So, like I said, it's a parable to teach, don't be greedy, don't get more than you can handle because when the crap hits the fan, you won't be able to handle it. My arms are weary. My sword has grown quite heavy. My time has now come. <coughs> Particularly in Jisei, uh, the battlefield was often quoted. However, many Jisei mention nothing of the battlefield. These are men <coughs> wounded on the battlefield. The last thing they want to think about is the fact that I'm bleeding out and dying. Uh, I mentioned the story in the uh, Rango workshop too. Oda Dogon, he's a man who basically created Edo. Edo used to be just a fishing village. And then he looked at it and said, I think this is a strategic position to build a castle. So he built a castle there. Uh, he built quite a few castles, but he built one in Edo. Eventually, when Tokugawa Iyasu took over the area, he looked at it and said, that Edo castle is pretty good. I'm going to build it up four or five or six times, and I'm going to make it my capital. Uh, and nowadays we call it Tokyo, but it all started with Oda Dogon. All these castles, he was very well respected, he became a very respected poet, and he was such a good poet that his master was like, ooh, everybody respects him more than he respects me. He could raise a revolt and take me over. I better get him knifed. <laughs> so he sent an assassin to attack Oda. Uh, now keep in mind, Oda Dogon is in his house. He's been invited in for a party. And he's taking a bath to wash the, you know, the travel dirt from him. An assassin jumps in and stabs him in the bathtub. And the assassin says, you're such a great poet, let me get you some paper and you can write your you know, final poem here as you're bleeding out of the tub. So he gets him some paper and some ink, and Oda Dogon, dying in the tub, writes, I wish I had it with me, I wish I'd had the forethought to do that. Uh, Something, not word for word, of course, but something to the extent of, if I had known that I was dead, I would have mourned the loss of my life. And then the assassin, you know, wrapped it, wrapped it up and delivered it while Dogon bled to death in the tub. That was his say. that was his final poem. <clears throat> but many of them have nothing to do with the battlefield. Uh, I, I did mention the one where you know, Shibata Katsuye is defeating the guy and he decides, well, I'm going to write my poem about killing Katsuye in the next life, because I'm petty. Uh, for this particular example, my Shimonoku would be, I place my head upon your lap to await my demise. Uh, Yamato Takaru. No, I'm sorry, I'm not too talking the story yet. Stories the next line. I gaze upon the mouth of the dragon and I shudder with delight. This kind of goes hand in hand to in the West, you know, we see knights battling dragons. There are things to be fought, there are you know, things to be overcome. 
But in the East, dragons are looked at as a sign of wisdom. You know, seeing a dragon in Europe would be, oh, this is a terrible thing. Seeing a dragon in the East is, oh, this could be a very good thing. This is, you know, a good omen. <clears throat> so you would see the dragon, you would shudder with delight. But along with that, we are in the West, so I kind of include with that a little, you know, combative point to it. I know that my greatest fear was never fighting back. That would be my Shimonoku. <clears throat> that would be Yamato Takara. Ah. Next to the maiden sleeping pace, I left the sword. Alas, it was that sword. I mentioned in the early part, Om. Syllables on Om don't often, well, sometimes they match up, not always. <clears throat> in this particular case, Yamato Takaru wrote Tonka. They follow the format in Japanese with Om. When you translate the syllables, you get that. All you get is a haiku out of it. It's all the more you make. Uh, and actually, I had to add a word to make it a haiku because the general translation of it is Next to the maiden's sleeping place, I left the sword. Alas, that sword. Uh, Takaru was a prince of the empire. He accomplished great deeds, but he was never the favored son of the emperor. And he constantly was sent out, you know, every time he would be sent out, do this suicidal thing. And he would win and then come back. And his father would go, Go do this suicidal thing. Conquer me more land. And he would go and he would do it. And finally, he was sent on his final absolutely suicidal mission. And he went to his mother and he said, you know, why does the emperor want me gone so? And she was like, oh, I'm sure it's not that. He respects you. Just go out and do the suicidal thing and he'll love you even more. In this particular suicidal thing, he doesn't make it. People are sent out to kill him and he's caught somewhat off guard. And one of his final poems is, next to the maiden sleeping place, I left the sword. Alas that sword, uh, to stipulate that he was, you know, out of guard and is finally coming to an end. Uh, I would perhaps add on to it with, if only I had thought of my head instead of my thighs. <laughs> <coughs> I heard somebody sigh greatly in that, and that time it wasn't you. Yeah. Yeah. Right, I got this back on schedule. <laughs> yes. Our final one. My Kaminoku. A great place to learn samurai history is Samurai Gaiden. If I didn't mention earlier, I read a web series on YouTube called Samurai Gaiden, the first Friday of every month, and occasionally a few addendum videos. Uh, we put up a video of something dealing with samurai history. Uh, the story of Oda Dokan one that we did last year, perhaps the year before, and it was thanks to his story that I really got into studying Waka, because he was such a prolific poet. And in the video, I've got a couple more stories about him, too. Uh, yesterday, at 7.30 a.m., our April video went up, and it is a very basic study, on, uh, or a very basic discussion on how katana are made. It was a viewer request. He asked how katana are made, so I delve into, like I said, a very basic layman's idea of Tomahogany steel is, how it's made, and how it's forged into a sword. <clears throat> a Shimonoku for this. So sometimes I wonder if my husband is too famous. <laughs> I don't wonder, I know. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I live with. <laughs> Speaking of shameless, oh. yes. <laughs> no. Yes. No. that was quite an excellent panel. Entertaining and informative, <laughs> don't you agree? Yes, it was excellent. Here, here. I took notes. Me, too, but there's so much I still don't know. Yeah, there's something I really didn't understand. Maybe we can ask questions and the fat guy who talked a lot will answer them. <laughs> hey, that's some experience there. But how do we express our interest in asking a question? Maybe if we raise our hand here, we'll call on us to ask our question. Like this? 
No, no, much higher. Like this. I wish to learn. I too demand knowledge. <laughs> Where the hell did Chinese Nicholas Cage come from? <laughs> I deal with that every time he has, uh, has the panel has questions. Every time. <laughs> so, on that note, we've still got about 10 or so minutes. Anybody have any questions? Go ahead. Did the samurai ever write a G say thinking they would die and then survive to write more? Uh, generally, if they did, then that poem wasn't considered a G say. But there are certainly circumstances where a samurai is, you know, about to face death, and he writes a poem, and all right, you know, take that back to my family, that's going to be my final poem, and it survives the battle. And then, of course, there are the opposite case where, you know, I'm definitely going to win, so, uh, you know, I'm not even going to bother to write a poem, and then they die. Uh, but tangent, Yamanake Shikanosuke is a great example of that. Uh, he is... Preparing to fight a duel, and his opponent changes his name. He you know, applies to the court to get his name officially changed. Uh, Shikonosuke was Yamanaka Shikonosuke's uh, court title. But the Shika character can also be read as Dio. So you could read Shikonosuke as Deputy Lieutenant of the Dio. So this guy gets his name changed to uh, a set of characters that can be construed as when the deer lowers its head to eat these particular type of delicious leaves, the wolf attacks and kills it. That's what he gets his name changed to. Uh, a lot more complicated than a symbol whenever you don't want to be called prince anymore. <clears throat> so they then fight this duel. They engage each other you know, from far, get in close, spear, sword. It gets down to the point where they've drawn knives against each other. They're rolling around in the mud. And Shikonosuke stabs him to death, cuts off his head, holds it up, and says, The deer has killed the wolf. Shikonosuke may have written a death poem at that point in time, but he didn't die, so we have no poem for that period in time. His Jisei comes much later in life, and I don't know it off the top of my head. <clears throat> uh, however, there is no death poem for, you know, recorded for his opponent. So either his opponent decided not to write one for various reasons, or it just wasn't very good, so it didn't like get known, or for whatever reason, we don't know it, uh, or it could have simply been that I mean, a guy willing to change his name to, when you lower your head, I'm going to eat you, probably figured, I'm going to win this. <laughs> Any other questions? Good? Uh, not, not so much a question as kind of a good thing about Waka. You talked about Sedoka, and certainly, yes, they sort of fell out of favor by the Heian period. But in Manyoshu, there were a number of Sedoka that are, in my opinion, some of the best poems in the entire collection. One in particular, it's one of these Sakimoi, Sakimoi-Yosha, border guard poems, and it's Isamakori Umiyashi ni suru, Yamayashi ni suru, Shimure koso kumi wa shiokite yama wa karetsu. It's like, does the, does the whalefish sea die? Does the mountain die? Uh, of, of course they die. Okay. Of course they die, the, the tide goes out and the mountain withers. This is a very moving sedoka from Manyoshu. Yeah, oh yeah, the Manyoshu was written early enough in there that there was still choka and kaduta and sedoka in there. Uh, it, it was one of the earlier ones, uh, and that, that's a, you know, a great point, but like you just said, uh, there were a lot of wonderful poems in these older forms, and then as the forms kind of waxed and everything became Tonka, they began to dominate the anthologies, but a lot of the, like you said, a lot of the older ones, the Manyoshu, uh, I cannot come up with that other major one that I, I really want to say, and uh, I can't think of it, something about leaves. That's Manyoshu and that means. Manyoshu is the one, okay. That's another one I can't come up with. But yes, that's, a, that's an excellent point, thank you. Uh, any other questions or points? We've got a couple of more minutes. Nothing? Okay, well.
thank you for coming and learning about Japanese poetry. Uh, this is, yeah, this is my last one of the weekend, so I don't have any more to show besides uh, the website and <laughs> web series that I told you about. Uh, Being it, it's done. Yeah, uh, if you go on my Facebook, my, my Facebook is Dick Jutsu. Uh, my name is Richard, in case you thought that was dirty. Uh, Jutsu is Japanese for technique or style. Uh, like I said, my name is Richard. I was named after my grandfather, Dick. So, Dick Jutsu means Richard's technique or Richard's style. It's a portmanteau. Uh, if you go on my Facebook, Amazon is holding a giveaway of my book. You have to watch one of my Samurai Guide In videos. <coughs> this particular one is our February video, Valentine's Day in Japan, and also the story of Tanabata. So, oh, I did have a slide for you. Great. Uh, if you just want Samurai Guide In itself, you can go straight to that URL. I am underprepared. This site is under construction at the moment. Uh, but so, if you actually want to watch Samurai Guide In, the best idea is to go to YouTube and just search for Samurai Guide In. Uh, I have two YouTube channels. One is Dikjutsu, one is Summer Get In. Uh, Summer Get In is starting up recently, so it, uh, a lot of the Summer Get In videos are still on my old Dikjutsu channel. But if you go to the playlist, it's got everything in it. <clears throat> uh, so like I said, thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, see you all again next year, too. Uh, and shamefully, give me good ratings in the guidebook. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Correct me if I'm wrong, so the Tonka could go as five seven five, go five uh, seven five seven five seven five, long and seven seven. Uh, that would be a choke. Choke, that would be a yeah. choke. Okay. Yeah, the Tonka it's still is long. The five, seven, five, five, seven, five, seven, 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 seven. Yeah, there are some that are. Uh, uh, no, I mean, one of the longest very, ones has like a thousand lines to it. <laughs> that's a joke. That's a joke of that. But oh, yeah. <laughs> that's what they, and then on top of that, they have a honga at the end. So they got that one yeah. last tonka. The one to last tonka to throw out there. Just that. Sum it up. Yep. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank sure. You.